So the osteoporosis community is full of recommendations. And if you are a frequent listener to my channel, you know that I'm an adamant supporter of a diet that supports bone and muscle development. I get asked all the time, why protein needs to come from animals? Well, in this video, I wanna review a study that's new to me, although a couple of years old, but a study that's new to me that does a great job of looking at the differences between eating protein from animals versus eating proteins from plant sources. So stick around because the differences may absolutely shock you. And this could definitely encourage you to take a close look at what you're eating and where you're getting your protein from. This study really reinforces previous articles that I've presented that demonstrate that lower bone mineral density is present in vegetarians and vegans, and that there's an increased risk of fractures in vegans specifically. This really flies in the face of this whole concept of the pH or alkaline theory of nutrition for bone health. So stick around. Let's go through this article. I want to tell you what it shows and how some of this information is actually kind of surprising to me and how it will actually impact how I look at these data and the lab values moving forward. All right, so as I mentioned, this study is actually not brand new. It's from 2021, so it's relatively new, but it recently made its way across my desk. The title of this article is Partial Replacement of Animal Proteins with Plant Proteins for 12 Weeks Accelerates Bone Turnover Among Healthy Adults, a randomized clinical trial. So why is this study worth talking about? Well, um, I think that it is a well-designed study. What I like about it is that it looks at the same biomarkers that I look at for bone turnover, CTX and P1 and P. I think it also does a really cool job of looking at the ratio between the two. It's too short, in my opinion, but it gives us a glimpse at what's happening here. And it would show that through the biomarkers that I also measure and like to look at, CTX and P1 and P, the differences of this 12-week intervention, as well as does an interesting job of comparing these through a ratio, which I had not seen before, uh, and I really like. And I also feel like it seems pretty unbiased. In the world of nutrition literature, it seems like the authors generally will have um, their bias around whether it be animals or plants or whatever it is that they're trying to prove. And rather than trying to prove themselves wrong, they seem like they're always trying to prove themselves right. And it's a really frustrating thing in the world of nutrition literature. This article seems pretty unbiased, which I, I dig. So um, let me walk you through this. So what they did here is, like I said, they did a 12-week uh, intervention, and they were able to get 107 women and 29 men into three different diet arms. So let me explain the diet arms for a second. So we had uh, kind of a control, which would be 50% of your protein coming from plants versus 50% coming from animals. And then they had what would, they would consider an animal-based model and a plant-based model. Now, I wish they would have been a little bit more rigid on this, but basically the animal-based model is 70% protein from animal products and 30% from plants, and then flip that for the plant-based model. So 70% of your protein from plants and then 30% from animals. And this gives some flexibility. Uh, so I understand that, but it also kind of muddies the water just a little bit. And then what I also think that they did was great was that they looked at uh, making as many things consistent as they could. So they defined a 17% energy from protein as their goal. And then uh, this was done in, in Finland, so they measure things in kilojoules. But if you do the conversion from kilojoules to kilocalories, what you can see is that they most people were on an average of a 2100 calorie diet. What's cool about this is that when you do the math of 17%, of 2100 calories, it ends up being about 92 grams of protein, which is close to what we're recommending. So that's cool. I did some math here too, just to give you an understanding because in the US people tend to eat less calories than in Finland apparently. But an 1800 calorie diet at 17% would be 75 grams of, of protein and a 1500 calorie diet would be 64 grams of protein. So that kind of tells you like wh where you would be compared to this study. The other thing that's relevant here is that, um, 80% of the food was provided by the um, by the study uh, group. So they were actually giving people the food so that they knew kind of what they were getting, at least from a, um, a part of what they were consuming perspective. Okay, so they had some of these things kind of uh, figured out. And this is closer to what you would see for a really good nutrition study, which ultimately would be, uh, you know, to be done in inpatient, right? So you bring these people into the hospital for 12 weeks, but then there's all kinds of issues with that. 
So like I said, they measured biomarkers, they measured CTX, they measured P1 and P, they measured a ratio and the way that they did this, which I like is P1 and P over CTX. I'll talk more about that. They also measured some other things like parathyroid hormone and vitamin D, and I'm not gonna get into the details of that because it's irrelevant to our conversation here. But I do wanna get into these biomarkers because I think it's really interesting. All right, so I'm gonna show this figure from this study. And what I wanna show here is that the uh, you kind of have three three boxes here, and the one on the left is P1 and P. So P1 and P, if you're not familiar with it, I talk about it often, but P1 and P is the uh, uh, bone building biomarker. So this is your osteoblasts building bone and the biomarker associated with that that you can look at in blood. CTX is the same thing from osteoclasts, so the cells that are breaking down bone. CTX uh, is a measure of the breakdown of bone. So as CTX goes up, bone breakdown is occurring more rapidly. Same thing with P1 and P as it goes up, bone building is occurring more rapidly. The ratio that they did, which I think was so smart, was to put P1 and P over CTX. Now, I had not done this before because they are they are presented from LabCorp, which we use here in the US. They're presented from LabCorp in different units. Uh, and what I recognize that they did here, which was so brilliant was to just convert the unit so that they're actually, you know, now they're on the same plane. So now we can actually compare P1 and P CTX and the changes in the ratio associated with that. So I love that. I'm incorporating that into our um, uh, lab delivery model because I think it's brilliant. I'll start in the middle because this is CTX. What's was not surprising for me is that CTX or osteoclast function went up in the um, plant-based group. So on this chart, you can see the little triangle is the plant-based group. Um, so it went up by 30%. So that's osteoclast function going up by 30% when you're consuming more of your protein from plants. Okay. Uh, now this doesn't surprise me because we know that there's an increased risk of um, uh, fracture and decreased bone mineral density in those that follow vegan and vegetarian diets, despite the pH. And so uh, if you look at P1 and P, I'm sorry, if you look at CTX for the animals, so again, that middle one, if you look at CTX for animals, what you can see is that the it was basically neutral, maybe a slight decrease actually in CTX, but it certainly would not be significant. So we'll just call it relatively neutral. So osteoclast function goes up with plant-based protein. It pretty much stays the same with an animal protein. Same calories, same amount of protein. We'll talk about why in here in a minute. P1 and P, so bone building biomarker, actually went up in the uh, plant protein group as well. Now this surprised me. I would expect it to go the other way. It went up by 11%. And again, in the animal protein group, it was kind of neutral. So I would have thought that those would have been flipped. I would have thought you would have seen more from the animal group than the plant protein group. But this is where I think the ratio makes so much sense. So if you look at P1 and P over CTX, you have to convert for us, you have to convert the, the units. But if you do this, then you can see that the ratio actually was reduced by 25% in the, the plant protein group. Now this makes more sense to me because in response to a large increase in osteoclast function, you would think you would also see an increase in osteoblast function. So this is actually very logical for me. Now, if you look at the ratio, and so you can see that the ratio was reduced by 25% in the plant group, and it was basically neutral, or it went up just slightly in animal group, again, not statistically significant. So we'll call that relatively neutral. So I think that's a really interesting way to look at this and explains the surprise increase in P1 and P. So you are getting an increase in bone metabolism, but it's shifted in the wrong direction when you get protein from plants rather than from animals. Other interesting uh, findings in this study was that over the course of the 12 weeks, the plant group dropped their protein intake from 17.7% down to 15.2%. The other two groups, the 50-50 and the animal-based group were, were pretty much even. So why would they have dropped their protein intake? Well, I think probably because it's just difficult to get over 90 grams of protein from plants, you know, and they go into this, in the study, they go into what they were eating and it was, they were getting uh, protein through beans and through grains, you know, the ways that, that most people that eat a fully plant-based diet would do that. What's happened over the course of these 12 weeks is that the, the plant-based group ate more calories, less protein, um, and over the course of 12 weeks, that's relatively short. Unfortunately, what I see is that that continues to, in that direction over the course of the time frame when people are on those kinds of diets. Okay, so if you're getting value out of this really interesting conversation, if you would do me a big favor and just click that subscribe button, um, that'll help us to get this information in front of more people. 
If you haven't yet and you're interested in more information about osteoporosis, consider joining our masterclass where we go through all of our different approaches to improving bone health naturally, uh, different things that you can do on your own and then how we do it as well. Also an opportunity to ask a few questions in that environment. If you haven't yet, if you are interested in downloading and reading our free book um, called The Osteoporosis Breakthrough, this is a really great jumping off point for those that are interested in learning more about osteoporosis. You can download the ebook for free or you can buy it on Amazon. Just do me a favor and leave us a review so other people, of course, can continue to see that as well. All right, so let's talk about how we put all this together. All right, so I want to revisit this P1 and P change that was so surprising for me. And again, when you do the math on 17% of your intake from protein in a 2100 calorie diet, it's 92 grams of protein, which is a fair amount. Now we have our patients, uh, as soon as they start with us, they will measure their intake. We know what everybody's consuming from a protein perspective. And most people honestly start out around 30 to 40 grams. Some people, you know, if they're conscious about it and eating animal products, maybe 70, maybe 90, but it's pretty rare. Especially our vegans and vegetarians that come in, I mean, they're eating, you know, 20, 30 grams of protein a day. So going from that to 92 is a massive increase. And so I do think we would see an improvement in P1 and P with that. Um, why we didn't see it with the animal group, again, I think is because we didn't see an increase in CTX. So bone metabolism didn't really change, even though their increase in protein may have. Uh, so I think that's really interesting. But again, the ratio is what really shows the, the benefit of the better amino acid profile, which I'm going to talk about in a second. But the better amino acid profile of the animal products versus the plant products and how the body just didn't need to change because there wasn't a significant shift in the ratio between CTX and P1 and P. All right, so let's talk about this amino acid profile. So when we look at the amino acids, so these are the, the components of protein, the things that make up protein are called amino acids. They're these little you know, protein subparticles. And the amino acids, when you consume protein, your, your body breaks down the protein into the amino acids, and then your body uses different amino acids in different ways. When you look at the amino acid profile of something that comes from animals versus what our body needs and in the ratio that it needs, they're going to line up almost identically. And they do so because animals are like animals. When you consume protein from plants, the amino acid profile is different because we have, I like to call it just a different operating system, right? A plant operating system is very different from an animal operating system. So the way that plants use amino acids and have them stored is gonna be different than that from animals. So you can mix and match different plant proteins to get a close to or similar uh, amino acid profiles animals. And you see this in certain uh, plant-based protein products, especially pea-based protein products. And so you can match it up, but when you're consuming it through diet, it takes a lot of intention and effort to match this up on a regular basis. Uh, so it is possible, it's just much more difficult. And so what we see is that there's going to be a reduction in absorption of uh, plant proteins compared to animal proteins. There is going to be blocking of some of the other nutrients that are coming in from the plants because of the potential anti-nutrients in plants. And then the utilization is going to be significantly lower. And so when we talk about gram per gram, plant protein versus animal protein, actually you need much more. So if we said that you needed 100 grams of animal protein, actually you're going to need probably 130, 150 or more grams of plant protein from natural sources to be able to actually hit the same amino acid profile or the amino acid minimums that you're getting on the lower end of the animal protein side. So this is where I think this conversation gets really skewed and why the study could have been more impactful if they would have done you know, a carnivore diet versus a vegan diet, but then there are other issues that go along with that. So I understand the, the method here. From my perspective, where we start for most people is to say, we want people to eat a a uh, protein forward diet, not a high protein diet, that's not the right sentiment, but a protein forward diet. And for a, let's call it an 1800 calorie diet, uh, let's say you weigh 120 pounds and we're aiming for one gram per pound for most people, of course, being cognizant of, of uh, kidney disease. But let's say we're aiming for one gram per pound of desired body weight and you're 120 pounds, which is, this is a lot of our patients in the bone health space. So we want you to eat 120 grams of animal-based protein. At 1800 calories, that's 27%. So this is a significant increase from the 17% that this study showed, right? So we're actually aiming for much more than that 17%. If you are, let's say a guy, let's say you're me and you're almost 200 pounds and I eat, let's say around a 2200 calorie diet, 
that's actually 200 grams of protein, right? So this is now 35 to 40% of my calories and protein. Now, is this a high protein diet? I wouldn't think so. Because we know that we have safety data up to three grams per pound, right? So I could have a 600 gram um, protein um, intake if I really wanted to push it. Now, I think that would be almost impossible to do. But if you look in the bodybuilding space, you know, people that are really trying to maximize the impact of, of, uh, of muscle building and, and being anabolic, that's where they're headed, right? And so we have to remember that this is not a high protein diet. This is an adequate protein diet. So take that for what it is. You know, I've never seen a study that showed that much protein for a bone health patient. But if we are to extrapolate the literature from the diets that we know most impact bone and most impact muscle building, then this is the recommendation that we make. And this is actually not just for people that have osteoporosis. Honestly, this is for everybody. This is the same diet we use for our health optimization patients. We just tweak it then differently based off of, you know, age, activity, and goals. Um, but that's the starting point for everybody, actually. One thing I wanted to mention too, I, I mentioned this earlier, and if you want to look any of this up, really look at the amino acid lysine. Lysine is something that is woefully deficient in plant proteins, most of them, um, and present in abundance in animal proteins. Other things to consider that you see in animal proteins, particularly red meat, that you don't get in plant proteins would be things like carnosine, creatine, B12, folate, other B vitamins, the list goes on and on of the things that you can get through animal protein that you can't get through plant protein that you would then have to supplement. So I never want to leave off one of these videos to say that you can't eat a specific diet. I know people that are that feel great on a plant-based diet, that are doing great on a plant-based diet. So it is certainly possible. But what I want to impart you with is that if you want to make it easier to get adequate protein, getting it from the right source that your body is going to uh, do well with and assimilate better, then this study helps to show that you are going to uh, have a better impact on your bone metabolism with an animal-based protein versus a plant-based protein. So I hope you found that helpful. If you have other questions, if you want more resources, consider joining our HealthSpan network. You'll see a link for that down below, or you can go to drdouglucas.com where we have links to all of our programs and the HealthSpan network is there as well. The HealthSpan network is where we allow members to communicate with each other, we have a weekly Q&A with myself, with my team, potentially with some guests that come on every now and then to talk about very relevant topics in the, the space of health span, not just osteoporosis. So this is where we look at osteoporosis and everything through the lens of health span. How can we live better longer? So super excited about launching the health span network. Hope to see you there. And if not, I'll see you in the next video or both.